In this video, I will show you how I got from this to this. Running Arch Linux and playing all of my favorite games at 60 frames per second. Maybe you got rid of that old yee yee ass haircut you got for less than $650. So before we start this video, I just want to preface this with saying that this is not an attempt to get you to switch to Linux. This is more so just documenting the steps that I took to get a budget-friendly computer off the ground, running an operating system that didn't cost me anything, playing all the games and running all the software that I want to run. If you're content using Windows or Mac and don't mind, you know, using 20% of your RAM on idle, or you don't mind having an operating system that comes with Candy Crush pre-installed or it was made by a company founded by one of Jeffrey Epstein's friends. That's totally fine. Keep using the tool that's best for the job. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Truthfully, just grab the cheapest mini ITX motherboard that I could find. I grabbed the Ryzen 5 4500 and an AMD RX 6600 XT, which I got on eBay for 200 bucks very used as you can tell. I got a 550 watt MSI PSI, a one terabyte WD Black, and 16 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance. The Cooler Master NR200 was probably the cheapest ITX case that I could find. I started off by taking it apart, removing everything that was inside. It came with a fan, so the first step was to install that fan onto the roof of the case. Pop that bad boy right in. Looks like it works. Then I moved on to grabbing the motherboard, where I was going to install the CPU, the RAM, and the hard drive. Popping in the CPU is pretty straightforward. Threw that in, put the lever down. And for this, I was just going to use the CPU cooler that came with the CPU, just to save a couple extra bucks. And I don't expect this to get too hot since I won't be overclocking. Grab the RAM, pop that right in. Here's some RAM ASMR. Then I moved on to installing the NVMe drive. Took off the little screw and popped that in. Of course, my first attempt at putting the motherboard into the case, I forgot the IO shield. So I then redid it. Screwed in the four mounting points. And then I moved on to installing the GPU. It's usually a little bit of a pain in the ass to get this in, but for some reason this wasn't too bad. Like I mentioned, the PSI that I bought was not small form factor, so it didn't fit where it was supposed to fit. I ended up just zip tying this to the side of the case. Probably not a great long term solution, but it was going to have to work for now since I wasn't about to order a new one. And here it is, everything plugged in. An old roommate once asked me if I ever heard of cable management, uh, and the answer is no. Here it is without any of the case panels on and it, it all seems to work. So the next step was to install the operating system. The first step when installing Linux from the terminal is to make sure that you have ethernet. So I spelled IP link wrong three times in a row until I confirmed that my ethernet cable was indeed plugged in. Then I moved on to partitioning my drive. I set up a 400 megabyte boot drive, a four gigabyte swap, and allocated the rest of my file system. I ran an LS block to make sure the partitions existed, and it was on to formatting those partitions. So I made the file system an ext4, the boot partition a FAT32, and I set the swap partition to swap. After that, I went on to mounting the file system. I mounted the boot partition to EFI. And I turned the swap on. Ran LS block again and made sure everything was in the right place and it was time to install base packages. Here I install soft firmware two times for some reason, but everything else was basically from the Arch Linux install guide. This of course took a while. What you're seeing here is at 36 times speed. So my computer is actually not that fast. Uh, from here, generating the FSTAB, made sure that looked all correct. And then I piped that over to my Etsy FSTAB, made sure that that all worked and rooted into my system. So I was able to confirm the installation worked and it was time to set up time zone clock 
and localization. Since I uh, speak English, I set this to EN US UTF-8 and ran local gen. Next step was to set a host name. I used fronting. It's I name all my computers after mythical weapons, and that is I just go on Wikipedia and look up mythical weapons and just pick one. I set up my user, added it to the group wheel, and I do that because it's easier to just give pseudo permissions to the group wheel. Once I've given my user a password, I run this pseudo or vi pseudo. And there's already a line in here that gives the group wheel pseudo permissions, so I just uncomment it out and save. I then changed user to the user I just created. I run sudo to make sure that that user now has sudo permissions, and it does. So I exit out of that, and it's time to start messing with some system CTL stuff. So I enable network manager, and for this build, I'm going to use XFCE. So I begin by installing LightDM and LightDM GTK greeter. as well as XFCE4. After it finishes installing, I enable LightDM. This is just so that it runs every time the computer starts. And then I run grub install against the drive, and I create my grub config. I have forgotten to install grub before, and I couldn't boot into my system, so that's a pretty necessary step. At this point, I was ready to reboot, and fingers crossed, everything all worked out. Not sure why my capture card rendered this as green. I see my light DM greeter, which is a great sign. I put in my password, and I'm greeted with my XFCE4 desktop. From terminal to a desktop environment. Now it's time for light customization and installing Steam and other things. So first thing I wanted to do was install i3 and wget. I don't like floating windows. I'm more of a tiling windows manager type of guy, so that's where i3 comes into hand. And wget was so that I can get my dot files off the internet. Configuring i3 and xfce is pretty straightforward. Just go into the session startup, turn off the xf windows manager and the xf desktop. And then I went over to application auto start where I made sure i3 was an entry in there. So now on login, i3 should automatically start up. I removed all of the existing keyboard shortcuts that XFCE comes with because those would conflict with i3. I log out, log back in, and i3 is installed and working. From here it was time to install Steam. I had to enable Multilib in my Pac-Man configuration and I went ahead and installed Steam. Since I have an AMD GPU, I went with the AMD provider. While Steam was installing, it was time to configure one of the most important things in a Linux environment, which is the Hatsune Miku 4K wallpaper. So I just grabbed the first image that I saw. I mean, what Linux user is not gonna have some weeb shit on their wallpaper? And then I halted my Steam installation so that I can install Nitrogen, which is my favorite desktop wallpaper manager. Once Nitrogen was installed, I ran that in a new workspace, set up the wallpapers directory, and set up my wallpaper. This is probably one of the most important steps when installing Linux. Once Steam completed installation, I went over to settings, compatibility, and enabled Steam Play for all games. Restarted Steam, and was ready to start installing all the games in Steam. For games outside of Steam, I went ahead and installed Lutris, which I, for some reason, forgot to record. But I use Lutris to play Battle.net games like StarCraft, Overwatch, and some of my emulators too. So the first game I installed and tried out was DayZ. I know what you're thinking, this looks terrible. I had just accidentally recorded this at a really low bitrate or something. Um, but yeah, even on extreme settings, consistent 60 frames per second. So this was my first quick test to make sure everything was working. Uh, I started getting shot at. Of course, it's DayZ. But yeah, extreme settings. It looks terrible here, but while I was in the game, it looked absolutely great. Uh, there did seem to be a little bar at the top of my screen. I'm not sure what that was about, but it did go away when I switched it from full screen to windowed or back from window to full screen. 
A lot of people are surprised to hear that Grand Theft Auto V also works on Linux. I did have to set the graphics to, I think, medium for this. I did get some lagging when it was set to high. But yeah, even with the explosions and the particle effects, remained at 60 frames per second. Got to roleplay as a bank robber, and, you know, just did regular Grand Theft Auto stuff. But yeah, very consistent performance in this game. Maybe you got rid of that old yee yee ass haircut you got, you get some bleep on your dick. Probably one of my favorite games since it came out, at least the story mode. Multiplayer kind of sucks in this game, but maybe that's a hot take. I've been playing Overwatch since it came out, and since then I've talked a lot of crap on this game, but definitely had to try and make sure that it does work, because my friends do like playing this game, and I, well, reluctantly admit that I like it too. Still. Even still. But yeah, I didn't break 60 frames per second. The reason for the poor quality is just because I was recording at a very low bitrate. I just haven't seemed to figure out my OBS settings yet, so. You know, hopefully in the next video, I figure out how to record an OBS without it making it look like absolute dog water. But for now, you just gonna just have to trust me that it looks great. This was also on medium settings, since extreme settings did tend to ruin my frame rate. Put the nuts on them! <laughs> <laughs> Next up was Fortnite. Psych! Fortnite doesn't work in Linux. Instead, we play Farlight, <laughs> which is like the Filipino mobile game version of Fortnite. Well, it's kind of like Apex, and Fortnite had an. Cambodian baby. But yeah, um, I didn't actually get to run Mango HUD in this game for some reason, but the frame rate was really consistent. It seemed to be 60 the whole time. I don't think I would recommend this game to people. It was the closest Fortnite clone that I could find. Um, it, this is kind of like the Linux version of Fortnite. You're not going to play Fortnite. Uh, Tim Sweeney's not going to let you. Not until the Steam Deck has, what did he say? Tens of millions of users, and we'll see when that day comes. Victory. Another game I've been playing lately is called Incursion Red River. This is still an alpha, but the game does look really good. It's like uh, Tarkov, if Tarkov was PvE. Now, it's my understanding that Tarkov does run on Linux. I just don't have it and don't really feel like buying it, since I probably wouldn't play it. Uh, so yeah, this was like the closest that I could get to showing something like Tarkov. The graphics are great. It's Unreal Engine. I did get some hiccups in my frame rate, even when I set the graphics to mid. I think this just has to do with the game being in alpha. So just a, a pretty good looking game that I wanted to share. Show that it does look good. The frame rate is pretty consistent, and you're able to play these early access games in Linux without really having any issues. So if you're using Linux specifically for gaming, ProtonDB is a great resource to determine if a game runs on Linux. So for example, if I were to type in Factorio, on ProtonDB.com. This will tell me Platinum. This runs perfectly out of the box, no tweaks necessary. Not all games are gonna run perfectly out of the box. For example, Call of Duty has a gold ranking, which means that you might have to make some tweaks to your Steam configuration in order to get it to work. Uh, games like uh, Fall Guys might have a silver ranking, which means you might run into some issues. It's not gonna work perfectly, perfectly out of the box, but some people have gotten it to work. In addition, Creative applications like the Adobe Creative Suite or music production software like Ableton and FL Studio don't really work on Linux out of the box. Some people have gotten the Adobe Creative Suite to work on Linux as far as I know, but I don't know what the performance of that is like. If you really wanted to run Linux and you were relying on a Adobe software, you could get something like VirtualBox and run Windows inside of a virtual machine in your Linux operating system so that you could spin up Windows, run your Adobe software, uh, without actually having to dual boot to Windows. I believe this works. You might want to do some research on this. However, if you do rely on software such as the Adobe Creative Suite 
or music production software, Linux may not be your best choice unless you're willing to tweak with your operating system, discover and learn some new tools and find ways to run your software on your machine. There are, however, alternatives to Adobe products and music production software. For example, I know Bitly is a popular DAW for making music. This is supported on Linux out of the box, but not many music producers are gonna be willing to learn a whole new set of tools to do their job if they're already comfortable with something like FL Studio or Ableton. Uh, in addition, uh, I use photop.com as a Adobe Photoshop replacement. This does everything that I needed to do. I created the thumbnail for this video using photop. Instead of using Adobe Lightroom, we have Darktable. That's something that works on Linux. However, I don't really recommend Darktable. Uh, it really doesn't seem to be as good as Lightroom, but it does do some of the things right. And last but not least, uh, DaVinci Resolve does seemingly work on Linux. I've never tried it, uh, but DaVinci Resolve is a great video editing application from what I hear. Great for color grading and things of that nature. I personally use Caden Live, and that is what I use to edit this video. Some people have their complaints about it. It doesn't really work great all of the time, but it does do the things that I needed to do. So just wanted to end the video letting you know that Linux can't run everything. There all are alternatives for the software that run natively on Windows and Mac if it's not already supported on Linux. And worst case scenario, you could get a virtual machine running in your Linux environment, spin up Windows in that virtual machine and run the software that specifically only runs on Windows. 